Hello everyone, you're very welcome to my talk today, which is part of Cot Ockram 1691's Heritage Week event. My name is Michael, and as most of you will know, normally our group would hold our talks in the Visitor Centre. But due to COVID-19, this can't happen this year. So this talk will serve as a taster, and we hope to see you next year in person. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy this talk. Many of you that are familiar with the Battle of Ockram will know that artillery played a key part in the outcome of the battle. The Jacobite commander, the Marquis de saint Roux, had his head taken off by a cannon shot, which caused such confusion and dismay amongst the Jacobite army that it is usually cited as the key reason for the Jacobite's devastating loss. In this talk, which I will divide into two parts, I will be looking at the origins of the artillery train, the creation of the position of Master of Ordnance, along with some key figures that held that position and in the second part, of what the artillery train itself consisted of in terms of equipment and personnel. So, the artillery train was not a fixed position. Artillery trains were formed in times of war and a master of ordnance placed in charge of it. The position was first created by Henry V in 1415 when the office of armory split away from the privy wardrobe of the Tower of London. The first man to hold the position was Nicholas Murbury. As you can see on the screen, the title has been chopped and changed throughout the years before it was gotten rid of completely in 2013. Despite the changes to the title, the role remained much the same and basically meant that the holder was responsible for all British artillery, engineering, fortifications, military supplies, transport, field hospitals and anything else of supplies of artillery. The Master of Ordnance was not subordinate even to the Commander-in-Chief of the British Army, so this was an extremely high-ranking position. Obviously the role was essential to the functioning of an army. Now, I'm going to introduce you to some of the characters that held the position. Well, don't worry, I won't be naming them all, there's too many of them. Just the ones that played a role during the war here in Ireland, and those that have a connection to it. First up is Admiral George Lake. First Baron of Dartmouth. He served between the years 1682 and 1688. George was an English naval commander who gave distinguished service to both Charles II and James II. His connection with the war here is that his last naval appointment was to command the Channel Fleet that unsuccessfully attempted to stop the invasion force led by William of Orange that landed in 1688. Following the invasion, Leg was dismissed by William and imprisoned in the Tower of London in July 1691. He died in the Tower a few months later in October, without having been brought to trial. George was the eldest son of the Royalist Colonel William Legge and Elizabeth Washington. Elizabeth's uncle, funny enough, Lawrence Washington, was the great-great-grandfather of George Washington of American independence fame. Now the next man to hold this position is a name that some of you may well recognise from the party played at the Boyne, Frederick Schomburg, 1st Duke of Schomburg. He held the position from 1689 until his death in 1690. Schomburg joined the Prince of Orange on his expedition to England in 1688, a second in command to the Prince. He was appointed Commander-in-Chief of the expedition of, to Ireland. At the Battle of the Boyne, he rode through the river to rally his men and was wounded twice in the head by sabre cuts and shot in the neck and instantly died. This deed was done allegedly by Cahar O'Toole of Ballyhubbock. After Schomburg's death, the post was vacant until 1693, until a chap called Henry Sidney was appointed to do it. Sidney was the first Earl of Romney and was an English politician and army officer. Most of you will know that William of Orange was actually invited to invade England by a group of English noblemen who became known as the Immortal Seven. This group, group wrote a letter to William, the author which is believed to be, you got it, Henry. Henry was present at the Battle of the Boyne in 1690, also served as Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. But he fell out of favour at the court of, under Queen Anne and his positions was then given to General John Churchill, the first Duke of Marlborough. Now, there is so much to be said about Marlborough that I'm not going to have time to go through a fraction of it here. 
Suffice to say, he served as Master of Ordinance twice, from 1702 to 1712, and again from 1714 to 1722. His career spanned the reign of five monarchs, Charles II, James II, William and Mary, Anne and George I. Marlborough was involved in the Battle of Sedgemoor, where he fought for James II, and also the Siege of Cork, where he fought for William III. He was honoured before his services at William's coronation with the Earldom of Marlborough, and he served with further distinction in the early years of the Nine Years' War. Rumours persisted, however, he was actually sympathetic to the Jacobite cause, to the point where he was imprisoned in the Tower of London. It was not until Queen Anne came to the throne in 1702 that Marlborough reached the zenith of his powers and secured his fame and fortune. He was married to Sarah Jennings and her relationship with Queen Anne was the subject of the film The Favourite, which some of you may have seen. Sarah eventually fell out of favour with the Queen and Marlborough was forced from office and went into self-imposed exile. He only returned when George I inherited the British throne in 1714. Interestingly enough, Marlborough's sister, Arabella, was James II's mistress, and it was their son, the Duke of Berwick, who fought for James in Ireland and who emerged as one of Louis XIV's greatest generals. So now we come to Richard Savage, Fort Earl Rivers, who procured a commission in the Horse Guards under Patrick Sarsfield in 1686. Richard was the first nobleman and one of the first people to join William when he landed in England, and he actually accompanied William to London. Jonathan Swift, who was friendly with him, once described him as an arrant knave. Not very nice. Richard served abroad in 1702 under Marlborough, who formed a high opinion of his military capacity. Rivers left no sons, well, legitimate ones, and so, at his death, the earldom passed to his cousin, John Savage who was a priest in the Roman Catholic Church. When he passed away, the family titles became extinct. Our next character has a name that may be familiar to some of you. James Hamilton, 4th Duke of Hamilton, held the title in 1712. We know that there were four separate Hamiltons at Ockram who fought on both sides. James was the descendant through his mother of the Scottish House of Stuarts and actually had a pretty significant claim to the throne of both Scotland and England. James was in the first, first cohort of James VII's Royal Order of the Tissot in 1687, so was obviously very close to the King, and he flat refused to join the party of the Prince of Orange. He was actually imprisoned twice in the Tower of London, suspected of intrigues, but was released without charge. Hamilton's father died in 1694, and in July 1698, his mother resigned all her titles into the hands of King William who regranted them to Hamilton a month later. In October 1712, he was created a Knight of the Garter, making him the only non-royal to be Knight of both Tissel and Garter. Now, were brown envelopes exchanged? Who knows? But Hamilton is a good example of the way loyalties changed at the drop of a hat during this period. The next gentleman is William Cadigan, who was a military officer in the army of the Duke of Marlborough. William was the son of a barrister, and his family were Irish Protestants of Welsh descent. William's grandfather, who was also called William, had served as an officer in Oliver Cromwell's New Model Army. Midway through his law studies, he joined the Protestants of Ulster and enlisted as a cornet of dragoons. In 1689, he took part in the defence of Enniskillen and served with the Williamite troops for the remainder of the Irish War. There is every possibility he saw action here at Ockram. We know that William was present at Dundalk camp during the autumn of 1689, which has become well known for the deplorable condition the soldiers faced. He was also at the Battle of the Boyne and the Siege of Cork. When Marlborough was dismissed, William went into voluntary exile with the Duke and in doing so lost his rank and positions. When King George I succeeded the throne in 1714, he was reinstated and the following year he replaced the Duke of Argyll in command of the army and put down a Jacobite rebellion. Now, I won't torture you with a pronunciation attempt here, as my French is not that great. But Francois was a Huguenot 
who left France for England and became a soldier. He served as a junior officer during the Williamite War in Ireland under the Earl of Galway and it's likely that he was here at Ockram. He was given command of Duke Hamon's regiment of foot early in 1692 and then joined the staff of the Earl of Galway as a Brigadier General in 1704. He fought in the War of the Spanish Secession and was appointed a Privy Councillor of Ireland. Now, we're getting there folks. Our second last man is John Campbell, who also held a position of Master of Ordnance twice. The first was 1725 to 1740 and again in 1742 for a short period. John's mother was Elizabeth Talmash, whose brother Thomas fought at Ockram for the Williamites. Campbell's grandfather, Archibald Campbell, the Knight Earl of Argyll, led Argyll's rising against James II, for which he was executed in Edinburgh in June 1685. Now our last man is John Montagu, who along with Marlborough and Campbell also held the position twice. He was a Master of Ordinance for the first time 1740-42 and back again in 42-49. John was the son of Ralph Montagu by his first wife Elizabeth. His grandfather Thomas Risley was married three times. The first which was to Rachel de Massou, who was an aunt of the Marquis de Rouveny. Rouveny fought here at Ockram and was instrumental in forcing the causeway. John, himself, was married to Lady Mary Churchill, the daughter of the Duke of Marlborough. 